Welcome to Psychedelics Today with your hosts, Joe and Kyle. Today is August 10th, and we are here with Catherine McLean. Uh, Catherine is an academically trained research scientist with a longstanding interest in neural correlates of consciousness and the science of well-being. At the beginning of her career, she lived in a four months, she lived in four months at a secluded retreat center in Colorado Rockies, studying the effects of intensive meditation on brain activity, concentration, and psychological functioning. As a postdoctoral research fellow and faculty member at John Hopkins University. She was one of the lead scientists and session guides studying the effects of high doses of psilocybin and other psychedelic compounds in healthy adults. Catherine now lives on a farm in Connecticut with her husband and baby daughter and is the co-founder and director of the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program in New York City. Thanks so much for joining us today. Catherine. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be invited. Start off maybe a little bit about your, about your background. Um, How did you get into the research and what, kind of what drove you to study uh, consciousness and psychedelics and meditation? Sure. Um, I, had the, uh, I had the privilege of going to college in a very beautiful, rural, uh, intellectually stimulating and kind of free-for-all environment uh, up in Hanover, New Hampshire at Dartmouth College, uh, which for what it's worth is where Jack Kornfield said he first took LSD. Uh, so the roots for both psychedelics and consciousness expansion and um, and kind of philosophy are, are strong there. And I spent a lot of time in nature, and I met this one man who taught rock climbing and kind of yoga classes and other outdoor activities. And he took me to my first meditation class. And there was a, a group of monks from Bhutan actually teaching in a tiny little storefront in Lebanon, New Hampshire, which uh, is uh, it's a total non sequitur like to see these monks teaching in this tiny rural white town. Um, and from that kind of moment on, I found meditation to be a refuge. And so I was really interested in that aspect of consciousness, the kind of stillness and quiet. And then the more that I kind of went into that, I became more and more interested in kind of the more crazy aspects of consciousness. And I always wanted to study psychedelics. Um, at the time when I was in college, I thought you had to go down to the jungle and study ayahuasca. And by the time I had gone all the way through graduate school studying meditation, finally the Johns Hopkins Mystical Experience Study was published in 2006. And it was like this door just kind of opened and the universe said, okay, this is where you can go. And um, it seems too good to be true, but the timing and the way that uh, Roland Griffiths invited me to the lab and everything seemed to just flow from there, that basically the the desire that I had in college was um, was ready to be fulfilled at that postdoctoral training level. Uh, so I think I had the opportunity that probably a lot of people wish they had, that they had a strong interest and then actually a professional kind of gate open to allow me to study it in a very kind of controlled and legal setting. Mm -hmm. Did you just go to some conferences or did you have some connections to to the um, postdoctoral world, um, to the research going on, or like, uh, did you have to do some serious hunting to find it? Well, again, I feel like this was a little bit too easy, right. uh, but there's a theme here about uh, scientists pretending, I don't say pretending in a derogatory sense, but pretending to be totally objective, but really interested in direct experience. Mm, right. And one of the reasons that it was so easy for me to get a postdoc with Roland was because he was a meditator and he had gone on uh, a retreat with some of the scientists that I worked with at UC Davis on the meditation study. And because of respecting those other senior scientists, knowing the meditation teacher who could also vouch for me and through all of that kind of networking of people who were scientists during the day, but also kind of interested in meditation and consciousness in their free time, I think that was a main reason why it was so easy for me to email him and kind of get through, like get through the filter of all of the interest that him and the Johns Hopkins team gets probably all the time of people constantly emailing and saying, can I work with you? Can I volunteer? Is there, is there a space for me? Um, so that's always, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a, an interesting trivia for me that 
most people, I think, don't understand what the life of a scientist is like. And I find it fascinating that there are a lot of scientists who present one way but are kind of equally fascinated by their own experience uh, and trying to study in the lab what they're fascinated by in their own personal life. Hmm. Interesting. Um, as a scientist kind of studying your own experiences, is it there sometimes like a, you're not supposed to bring like your own bias in? I've always kind of like heard that if you are interested and in you, like you've had your own experience, um, sometimes it could kind of like um, throw the research off because you might have your own bias towards it. Yeah, it's a big question. Um, it doesn't really come up in a lot of fields other than psychology. And it's, I think most psychologists are fascinated by their own mental experience, their own emotional experience. And that's what kind of draws them to study some particular topic. Mm -hmm. Um, the issue of bias doesn't come up as much outside of the world of consciousness because consciousness is so subjective. Um, mm -hmm. and the interesting thing to me too, is that in this field of contemplative research, all of the scientists I know studying meditation, I mean, I don't know a single one who doesn't meditate <laughs> and no one's asking them like, are we, are you sure we can trust you with this grant? Like maybe you have a secret agenda to promote meditation and, mm. um, you know, I think you're biased or, you know, uh, we need really real objectivity here in order to fully kind of parse out what the effects of meditation are from either placebo or, or expectation. And yet those questions are constantly, they go, they're constantly coming up when it comes to psychedelics. Mm. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that one is a drug and our culture has a certain relationship with drugs and the other is a behavior that even if it causes some of the same chemical reactions in the brain, uh, it's not a category of behavior that has been made illegal, has been controlled, has a kind of ha a taboo around it. I mean, it's a little weird to some people, but it's, it's just sitting there focusing on your breath. It's not that, it's not that threatening. Mm. Interesting. Briefly, I guess we don't want to gloss over it at all, but your your time doing the research in in retrospect, like was it was it just not a good fit for the long term? Was it how do you feel about it now looking backwards? Um and all the time you spent in the lab? I was just uh kind of reflecting on this with a friend of mine who is a he started this um podcast and group called The Secular Buddhist. And these questions around objectivity and bias and personal experience and science always come up for him and the people that he's kind of interviewing. And I spoke with him very early on in my career when I was all gung ho and, you know, I can study this scientifically. I can do this job. It's really stressful, but it's really rewarding. And now it's only, you know, about five years later. And I feel that, I crossed some threshold where I could no longer be as objective as I thought I needed to be. Mm. And I want to kind of unpack that a little bit. What I mean is that when your daily life is spent in the room with someone undergoing high dose psychedelic experiences, the person is obviously affected the most, the one who's taking the chemical, but so are the people in the room. I don't think we have a proper science around, you know, a scientific understanding around what those um, kind of extra, you know, extra individual effects are. Uh, but they felt real to me. I know that they have felt real by, you know, other people who've been in sessions. And it eventually started changing my entire perception of reality beyond work, mm. uh, such that. I started to feel that my average set point for consciousness was shifting more in the direction of that kind of fluid, non-dual, um, kind of crazier space of psychedelics. And I, it was hard for me to see how I could continue doing what I love to do, which is be in sessions with volunteers and turn that off enough to do the extremely rigid, focused, kind of structured career of grant writing and going to faculty meetings and competing at the highest level in academia. And I kind of, I could have done the calculus at a rational level, which I eventually, I had to convince myself rationally that I couldn't do it anymore. But really, it was a, an event in my personal life when my sister died that kind of 
you know, switched the balance and made me realize that I was trying to do something that for me was going to be impossible or it was going to become impossible fairly soon into the future. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a difficult decision and I still, I don't question it anymore, but there was a period of about a year or so where I was constantly dealing with that, you know, can I, you know, if anybody can do this, I should be able to, you know, I have all the training I need. I have the confidence I have, um, the ability to deal with kind of this flipping back and forth with different styles of reality. But, um, ultimately I just, I don't think I was cut out for it. Um, mm. I think I could have probably done one or the other, but not both. Yeah. That sounds really tough, especially to sit in a room when somebody's going through like probably like huge transformation or just digging deep, deep in their psyche and then having to like hold that space and then turn it off to do some sort of statistical analysis of everything. I mean, yeah, that'd be really challenging. Yeah. I think the best, the best researchers are probably the ones who are doing the least direct guiding direct session work and the best guides are the ones who don't necessarily have to be managing the research and, um, doing all the kind of the financial, logistical, administrative aspects of the research. Mm -hmm. um, it does take a very different mindset, and it's a unique person who can flip back and forth. Um, I'd be curious. I, I know that there's an anthropologist right now. He's a student, and he's at. I think he's been at Hopkins. He might still be there. And he's been interested in how the research actually affects the researchers. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to sit down at any length with him, but this is a question that fascinates me because it's something I think that isn't talked about, that right. you're, you're kind of, you're diving into the depths of consciousness yeah. and then having to kind of like somehow come out of that and be a normal scientist. And no one really, I don't know, I don't know as many people who talk about what that, what that does to you long-term. Yeah. Well, how has it affected you? Um... I mean, I guess if you don't mind me asking. No, it's a, uh, it's affected every single aspect of my life, which is why it's hard to answer. Yeah. Um, I almost feel like there were kind of two, two or three major periods of my life. The first period of my life was the period of my life before I had taken any, uh, any kind of chemical, you know, it's like kind of never had drank before, never smoked, never tried any drug except I guess nitrous at the dentist's mm. office. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So maybe nitrous was the marker at age 17 or 16. And so it was everything up till then <laughs> when it's just the kind of normal, like sober dreaming and child reality. Mm. And then there's the period of, you know, drug experimentation, which I think varies from person to person. But even if all you do is alcohol, that's a pretty significant shift in consciousness. And so that extended throughout my twenties. And then this huge shift, which was when my sister died and while I was working at Hopkins and that shift has been impossible to go to kind of, to revert back from, mm. um, there are things that I witnessed in sessions with volunteers and with my sister as she was dying that completely upended my ideas about the rational world, the natural world, what science had any, um, had any understanding of. Mm. And it really threw, I could no longer be a skeptic in ways that I felt I needed to be to be a proper scientist. Mm. Um, and so you could almost talk about it as kind of a religious conversion, except I don't, I didn't convert to a religion. I converted instead to this kind of mysterious space of not knowing, mm -hmm. uh, the closest thing to me, you know, was Buddhism, but still there was that abyss of just like, I don't know what to do now because everything that I knew before is not true. And there are things that I know to be true that are way more compelling <laughs> and way more interesting, but nobody else really agrees except for a few crazy people. There are people who take psychedelics and meditators. Right. Um, mm. <laughs> so yeah, I could go into any detail of that that you guys want, but um, I'm laughing just because it is kind of, you know, it's, I think in our culture, you're taught that you plan and you kind of choose a life path, you make goals and you progress along a career. 
And then for some of us, it's a personal event in our life that all of a sudden you realize you're not in control. You actually never had any clue what was going on. Mm. And that all of these events were preparing you for something that was totally unexpected. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> that hits me because, um, yeah, like I've mentioned in uh, my, the podcast where Joe interviewed me of having a near death experience. I mean, that totally just like shifted my life and I've had a hard time kind of, um, you know, kind of thinking scientifically in some sense. Like I, I really like to explore subjective experiences, I think because of that, but um, there's just a part of me where I, I see the world in such a different light. It's hard to s stay in that world. Um, yeah. But I, I, I'm, I'm really interested, um, you know, you, you've spent a lot of time working with psilocybin and being with people that have this, you know, are pr transitioning into death. Um, and in my, I, I think I briefly mentioned this story to you before, and if not, it's kind of in the, it's in the uh, podcast I recorded about my story. But, um, you know, I just had this like similar, this experience with psilocybin and then with my near death experience, which was so similar. Um, and, you know, I, ha I had this near death experience and then I went into like this pretty long, deep depression, trying to figure out what life is, you know, existential crisis. And then had this experience with psilocybin at, at like a young age, probably like 20 or so. And when I was in the process of it, it was like, I'm dying. Like, I remember what this feeling's like. And, um, I don't know. It, I, I would just love to maybe like hear your thoughts about that. Like maybe the similarities or, um, yeah, of death and, you know, the psychedelic experience. If you have any opinions. Yeah. I, um, I've started to think about, or lately I've been thinking about this comes up in meditation retreat. It comes up in psychedelic sessions. I, at least from what I've seen, it comes up when people are physically dying, that there's kind of all this lead up. And during the lead up to the experience is a lot of fear. It's a lot of attempting to control. It's a, a lot of kind of distorted, delusional thinking. Um, it's kind of like desperately trying to connect with loved ones or kind of somehow avert the experience. And then at the moment when people can't do anything else, they give up. Mm -hmm. And in that giving up is this just very natural moment of surrender. And that's what death is. Mm -hmm. So much so that you're like, what was all the fuss about? <laughs> and I think the challenge is that people don't believe that that's how physical death could actually be. Mm -hmm. They're like, no, it has to be different. It can't, you know, it can't be that easy. It can't be that natural. Um, it was kind of, I mean, I didn't realize this until I gave birth, but it was very similar with birthing my daughter. It was there all this lead up that I had to analyze all of my fears about control and my safety and her safety and getting everything right, like the music and the candles and the hot, you know, the hot tub. And, and ultimately when she was born, it was just this extremely functional event, the actual birth, you know, the actual kind of coming out that all of that other stuff didn't matter. Mm. It's like, it helped me psychologically to get to the point where nature just kind of took over. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we don't want death to be that simple. We want it to be this whole big thing that we're going to prepare for and do the right way and have the right people there and the right drugs. And, and ultimately it's just like you do whatever you need to, to get to the point where you can give in mm. or give up. And I don't mean give up in like a, a negative sense, like really give up to something greater than yourself. Yeah. And I think that's how death finally happens. Um, I still have a lot of fear about death, even though I actually have experienced those moments so many times. Mm -hmm. And it's, maybe that's just kind of how we were programmed. It's like we have to be fearful about the lead up. But then in that moment, I, I have to believe that we all reach that point of trust where it just happens and it's, it's no big deal. Yeah. Um, at least from, and I don't think that's just me. If you listen to most people who've experienced death, once you're kind of on the other side of it and like you were, you know, you do realize that there is that kind of simplicity to it. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting hearing you say that because that, that was kind of my experience, you know, when I, before getting into the emergency room, um, that's all I could think about. You know, I, I ruptured my spleen. I was 16 and then, 
they, they told me, you know, you probably had internal bleeding and whatnot. And then by the time, like, I really, like, I was probably lost, like, five and a half pints of blood, like, every, like I, I, I entered that total surrender. Um, and it was really beautiful. It was really calm. It was really peaceful. Um, and yeah, just surrendering into it. And like when I explain it to people, I think maybe it freaks people out because they think it is supposed to be like, you know, it's not not that easy. But um, I don't know. Well, I, think it, I think it also uh, it scares people that they won't be able to come back and tell that story. It's like we're right. so in love with stories. Mm hmm. And in Zen, there's a saying that um, I don't even know who to attribute it to. I've heard a number of teachers say this, that Zen is about learning to tell better stories, mm. stories that actually serve you and others, and learning how to stop telling stories. <laughs> and it's like, basically, that's that's the purpose of Zen. And I think that's the purpose of a lot of contemplative paths or kind of paths of, of inner journeying that, you know as far as we can come back and tell the story, we, it's our imperative to tell accurate stories. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you've had a near death experience or I've seen my sister die, sure. Tell all of the like really scary parts and the fantastical parts, but also talk about how simple it is. Mm -hmm. And if people don't hear that, then they'll just focus on all the other like theatrics. Right. And also it's like, if you, you know, if you, if you only focus on the story, and people don't realize that at some point you're going to have to stop telling all stories because you'll be dead. <laughs> <laughs> like you're also, that's also missing the point. It's like, mm. it's, it's both. And I think I get caught up in that, then that, in the dead part, the, the, like the dead being a fi a final position feels weird to me mm. because I've always kind of moved into it and come back and moved into it and come back. So it's like, I am still very much curious. What does that mean to move into it and not, not, yeah. <laughs> like, what is that about so most I of mean, your exposure with psychedelics has been with people transitioning into death I, I've heard it discussed uh, probably more philosophically as being psychedelics being practiced for death um, and that, that transition from like uh, the onset to I guess coming up towards the plateau of a, a over threshold experience being like that that giving up the simplicity of just that flipping over people want to call it ego death. I just don't know that that's the right term. Um, ego giving yeah, up over to whatever is larger. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that feels weird to me about ego death is that the, the deaths that I saw people go through with psilocybin were not different than the death I saw my sister go through, except for the stopping breathing part. It's mm -hmm. like, so if you want to say that ego death is death minus the stopping breathing, I guess so. But it's like ego death makes it sound like something intellectual. Yeah. Like there was a part of you that wasn't dying and then the ego was dying. And it's like, no, it actually feels like you're dying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It feels like you're dying. And even when someone's physically dying, it's an ego trip because it's like, you're not like, oh, right now I'm really dying for real. So I'm going to do it differently. People still feel like they're not going to die. Mm. There's still that clinging to life. In both cases, there's that clinging and resistance. And um, as another teacher of mine said, it's like, even when you're actually dying, most people don't know it. Hmm. So from the, from the subjective point of view, it doesn't really matter whether it's on a drug or whether it's your last breath. Mm -hmm. It's like consciousness is still kind of going through the same transformation, mm -hmm. uh, at least according to kind of what I've seen. And um, I'm sure people like Stan Groff and others have seen thousands and thousands of iterations of what I'm talking about. But the general, you know, saying seem to be similar. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to clarify that I actually I've worked with very few people who you could call very close to death. Mm, thank but you. I've. But even the healthy people who I've seen go through death experiences, uh, it struck me that it didn't matter that they were physically healthy, mm -hmm. which is even more fascinating. It's I think sometimes the conversation happens where it's like, well, we should give psychedelics to people with terminal cancer because they're really about to die. And it's like, well, how do we know? <laughs> I mean, you know, in hospice, there are certain signs, but I hope that someone isn't waiting until those signs are apparent and then they'll take whatever drug. Um, I didn't know if any of my healthy volunteers were 
a week later going to be in some accident. It's like we don't actually know when anyone is going to need that preparation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's a bit of a false, it's a false setup to say we should, you know, have psychedelics for certain people who are really close to death or suffering. But the rest of us healthy people should just like hang on until the last possible moment and then we'll get this experience that should help us <laughs> yeah well, i totally back. disagree with that setup like that, that well if people are seeing it that way but that's the way it is currently but i think only because we're working towards the legalization where we could then have a lot of applications for it mm-hmm. i don't i don't know do, do you see it that way or do, do you actually feel like it's it's those people that are about to die that want it get it I think it's the opposite. I think lots of healthy young people want psychedelics and people who are about to die are kind of freaked out and are like, I don't know if I need psychedelics. And whereas the researchers are like, okay, where are all the people who are about to die? We'll give them the psychedelics and the healthy young people like, Oh, I don't know. Um, maybe only for scientific purposes. You know, we need to be really careful. This isn't, you know, this isn't promoting recreational use and, you know, so it's like it's from one perspective in the clinical research and in the real population of people, people with cancer aren't typically looking to have their first mushroom experience. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's young people. I mean, it's young, healthy people who are looking to have their first mushroom experience. So let's like think a little bit more about how to make that more positive and transformative for people mm-hmm. if that's what's really happening in the world. Mm. Yeah. And I, I don't think it is happening in the world it's what people want there's a market there's if you want to talk about it in markets there's a market for that and there's been a market for that for a while it's just not um implemented i guess very well i think the only way to do it currently for for most people when they look at the world is ayahuasca and having to fly to south america and that's just such a it's such a it's such a crazy barrier i i you know i i don't want to doubt how awesome it is to do it down there but i i just i think it's such a weird barrier that we put up when we talk about how great it is to do it in the jungle or something and and that being the only one that's really really spiritual or really transformative but all these things are right well that's the option if you want to do it completely legally i mean i think the reality is that most young people are finding themselves doing psychedelics for the first time in suboptimal conditions because they're not thinking like, oh, what's the safest way to do it? What's the most healing way to do it? Um, They don't even know who to ask. I mean, uh, through the work that we're doing in New York City, we're still, we're we're just starting, but we'd really like to do outreach among teenagers and people who are basically first getting curious about taking psychedelics um, and hopefully being able to give them enough information and education that they can make the best decision for themselves, mm-hmm. as well as provide the integration support afterward. Because at least in my view, without you know saying it's a good or bad idea, you can take someone who's 18 and that experience can dramatically shift where they're going to go in life, you know, their kind of life choices, how they view themselves in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so what a great opportunity to to get someone at that point, rather than we also see people who come to us and, you know, they're in their fifties and they said, the most important thing that ever happened in my life was when I took acid for the first time when I was 20. And I've never talked to anyone about it because it's too weird. It's, you know, the culture has changed. Now I'm, you know, a corporate, uh, lawyer or banker or whatever. And they're finally coming to our groups and saying like, I, you know, you guys don't think I'm weird that this was the most meaningful thing I ever experienced. Mm -hmm. And we're like, nope, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is part and parcel of this territory. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I kind, I kind of always view this as uh, like a topic of like rites of passage that we lack in our society, and just thinking about these substances being like kind of tools to help with transition into death. I mean, like we're all gonna die, you know. And rites of passages were usually kind of like. Um, transition events to help people transition to one role to another role and uh, 
I mean, to talk to young people that are going to probably experiment to kind of have this net because it's not there. I mean, people are going to go off and do this stuff um, regardless, but just having that information out there and kind of creating that net where you can catch them. I think that's like really interesting. Um, I, I definitely saw that a lot with um, I worked with teenagers for a while, um, like at risk teenagers. And, you know, they always come in with their drug experiences. But I always saw it as like kind of like this like lack of rite of passage that they were recreating and there's no uh, cultural net or the elders weren't there to say, hey, yeah, um, you know, some of us has been through this and this is how we can work through it and hopefully grow into something else. Yeah, it's um, it's something that I also think is is missing from, I mean, I've talked about this before, but missing from the clinical research that's currently going on because most studies have a minimum age of something like 25. Mm. And um, if the national surveys are any indication, most people are having their first drug experience before 25. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think at the IRB, at the level of the institutional review board for the ethics and maybe at the level of safety for the FDA, those minimum age requirements make sense. But you could also argue that the real population of people who need the most attention from the scientific community in terms of risk and benefit are the people who are first getting exposed mm -hmm. um, and possibly, you know, expanding the repertoire from just the standard psilocybin, LSD, MDMA. I mean, there are all these research chemicals now that have no safety data. Right. Uh, people don't know anything about them except for, I think, obviously the Shulgin experiments, but mm -hmm. um, people are turning to these drugs with unknown histories because they're easier to get or they're kind of questionably legal. And um, we actually have no idea what the effects are on the brain and the body in the long term. So it's like the whole making certain classes of drugs illegal has actually created a lot more harm and mm -hmm. a lot more um, kind of unpredictability, I think. And that part of it, the scientific world isn't even touching just because it's not, you know, it doesn't fit, I think, with the with the funding priorities and – um, especially with kind of changing the regulations. It's like we're not going to reschedule psilocybin for young people. It's going to be rescheduled for a certain disorder. Mm. Well, huh. when, you, when you say scheduled, are you talking like like class three, like heroin or whatever, like that kind of classification system for law enforcement or classification into how it would implement into the medical world? Well, I think both, but I mean, first and foremost, I think the the scheduling at the legal at the kind of DEA level matters. Mm -hmm. Right now, um, I mean, with psilocybin and LSD, MDMA are all at the basically most strict schedule, which means no medical value and high potential for abuse. Both of which factually are incorrect. Um, there are, if you just look at the science that has already been done, there is evidence of potential medical benefit and. There's really little evidence of high abuse potential. Mm -hmm. Potentially with MDMA, there's a little bit more evidence for addiction, but um, not compared to most drugs that are in that category. Ketamine is is Schedule Three. You know, it's it's two it's two steps down. So if ketamine, um, and in some states, nitrous is unscheduled. So if some of these drugs that are as dramatically consciousness shifting are um, at least at the legal level considered. Um, less, um, less potential for abuse or potentially some medical value. Uh, it's ludicrous that the drugs that are classic hallucinogens are still hanging out in that top, in that top position. Um, I almost feel like, and I think my scientific colleagues have disagreed with me, but I think we've seen this happen with cannabis where the, when the legal structures started to shift, then more medical research could be done. And I don't know which is going to have to go first when it comes to psilocybin or MDMA or LSD. I think the researchers are banking on the medical, um, the medical community kind of getting behind the, the findings and pushing for a shift in, um, in the medical side of what the, the drugs could be used for and that eventually the kind of legal part will follow. But um, it's an unknown path. I mean, it has never been pursued before. Mm. So it's all kind of unknown how it's going to play out. Mm. So it's actually a decent transition to what we talked about before. It was the, um, I guess, kind of privilege and, and drugs 
privilege in psychedelic treatments, mm -hmm. for instance. You you were mentioning that in the, in the research, a lot of people were not being selected for the studies, um, not necessarily because of class, but it, it could have been a class issue. Um, maybe lower class people had more psychological damage or something, and and as a result, it would have skewed the data or something. But what what have you been thinking about on this subject for a while? Yeah, it's um, it's kind of come to the surface of my consciousness recently. Uh, I feel like I was kind of keeping it, it at bay for a long time. Um, potentially, I think it was because I was still, you know, I was recovering from the death of my sister. I had left my job. I was kind of recreating a life for myself. I, had, you know, given birth to my first child you know, living on a, in a new environment on a farm, it's like all of my attention was focused on kind of me and my very microscopic circle. And now I actually woke up in the middle of the night last night, like totally freaked out by a nightmare. And instead of just being like, Oh, that's just a nightmare. It was this shock to my system that it's just like, Oh my God, there are so many people who are living this nightmare every mm -hmm. single day of their life. And they have no choice that this, uh, that, Basically, any moment out of the blue, their life could be completely disrupted by some perceived evil force coming in and saying, you don't, you're not allowed to live, you're not allowed to live this way, you're not allowed to be here. Um, whether that means, you know, you're not white or you're lower income or, um, or because of your culture, your religion. Um, and so it's caused me to reflect on how uh, I was in a position of privilege being a researcher at Hopkins. Most of the volunteers came from privileged backgrounds, not exclusively, but for the most part, um, which is interesting in a city like Baltimore, where 60% of the city is African-American. Mm. And yet I think we probably, I would have to go back and look at the numbers. It was probably flip-flopped, you know, maybe 30% of our volunteers were not white. Mm. I mean, forget any specific demographic. It was, you know, white and not white. I mean, I remember a handful of my volunteers who were, um, uh, there was one woman from uh, the islands, from Trinidad. So she wasn't African-American, but she was black. Um, another woman who was Latina. Um, but for the most part, it was it was people of privilege and, and white people who were volunteers. Um, and so it brings up some questions for me. Uh, could we have done a better job of recruiting people who better represented the city that we lived in? Mm. Um, what were the barriers to that recruitment? Um, were people not passing screening on the phone? Was it something about uh, the comfort level of people seeing kind of a weird advertisement for something spiritual? And then, you know... I don't know if, and we see this in Buddhist communities in America that a lot of people who do meditation retreats, it's a, it's mostly white people, and some retreat centers are trying to do more retreats for people of color. Um, it at one level you're just like, oh, you throw your hands up, and you're like, we did the best we could, you know, these people were at least a representative sample of people who are interested in taking psychedelics and interested in spirituality, fine, and they're human, so they're going to die. And that's an important existential, you know, an issue around suffering that affects everybody. But being more and more away from that research environment, I do think that something could have shifted from the research perspective to, um, to do a better job of, of bringing different types of people into the study. Mm. Um, just to also mention, I mean, some of the research that was going on in the same building was with methadone patients and people with various substance use disorders. And none of those studies had trouble getting people who were not white, who are from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So mm -hmm. why is that? You know, you just change the drug that you're studying. You start looking at a drug that's more problematic and all of a sudden there's no problem finding people of color, mm -hmm. volunteers. Yeah. Um, I don't have any answers. It's just something that has now kind of struck me as um, maybe it's been there since the beginning of, of psychedelic research in America, that it's kind of always been this upper crust um, 
it's a question of people with privilege saying like, oh, I have some, I have some luxury and some free time. Maybe I should try taking these drugs and seeing what happens. Mm. Yeah. And I wonder also too, with the spiritual pursuit, um, you know, that some of these substances can elicit, uh, I, I just, something that you mentioned about like the meditation retreats, um, how it's most majority white. I mean, I just Wait, think, fun. is that so, oh, Frankie was crying. Can you hear that at all? No. Okay. Um, but it just, it makes me wonder too about like, just like spirituality in general, like, you know, people spend thousands of dollars to go to retreats. Like, it's not like it's catered to people in poverty and, um, maybe people of color. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, it brings up a kind of more insidious critique, which is that these plant medicines, came from cultures of shamanistic cultures, indigenous tribal cultures that were um, colonized by white Europeans. Right. Uh, you know, who committed genocide and destroyed communities and made these religions go underground to kind of survive. Uh, you know, all of a sudden this, you know, this this white kind of fairly wealthy banker dude goes down to Mexico, tries the mushrooms um, potentially does a pretty good thing, which is introduces the West to this class of medicines with psilocybin. But he leaves behind him this pattern of privileged people going down to take mushrooms in, you know, quote, in the jungle uh, with a woman who dedicated her whole life to healing people. And now her life is kind of ruined by these tourists. Mm -hmm. And because she's a good person, she keeps helping people. But I think Maria Sabina was quoted as saying that once the mushrooms had been given to white people, God would no longer like show up or something, or it's mm. like mushrooms would no longer be a, a reliable gateway to God. Interesting. It's like it's, it changed the medicine in a way that took, took that part of it and, um, and kind of broke that relationship. Mm. Yeah. I remember hearing, it was like a mushroom documentary. Somebody said that Maria Sabina kind of regretted giving Gordon Watson the mushrooms and was saying like years later and was saying that like, you know, um, our culture was really interested in like the visual aspect of it and where she was like, our people really pay attention to the emotional state um, about what's going on inside. It's not about like what's going on externally. Um, and it was about kind of like that spiritual experience but um yeah it, it's really interesting i had a friend from peru and i asked them about you know what, what do they know about ayahuasca and just so casually they were just like i don't know it's medicine of the jungle i was like well what do you mean it's medicine of the jungle and they're like well you know you, you get sick and you go see a shaman and they just give you medicine and that's what ayahuasca is and it's like i don't know you ask anybody here you get this whole thing about like you know you clean your chakras and like it's this spiritual experience and you see the cosmic serpent and it was just really interesting to hear it come from somebody that lived in peru it was it might have been part of their culture i don't know if they ever have drank ayahuasca before but it, it just how casual it was it's like yeah, i don't know it's just medicine and it's just like huh all right <laughs> There was um there was a, a a researcher I met from oh, where was he from Norway and he believed that all of psychedelic experience was expectation and placebo. Hmm. And I kind of pushed him on this. I was like, "All right, well, we know that there are actual physiological like, you know, biochemical effects." And he said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, but that's that's just like an on or off switch." He said once the switch is on, he was convinced that our culture experiences psychedelics in the way that it does because of the stories that we have been told by the first few people who took them. Mm. And I was like, I guess I can't argue with you because I heard the stories before I had any direct experience or saw anyone have a direct experience. And I'm trying to think if there was a single person in the Hopkins study who had never heard a single story <laughs> about psychedelics. That's the study that should be done, right, in terms huh. of basic understanding. Can you find the, the group of people who know nothing about psychedelics and give them the drug for the first time and see what happens? 
All right, students, let's try and make this research happen. <laughs> that is a very uh, interesting idea. Yeah. I, I think it's fascinating. I bet, actually, that there's uh, Christian communities that have people between 21 to 25 years old in this country <laughs> that, that know nothing, have heard zero stories about psychedelics. I, it has to be the case. Um, there might be some Mormon communities too, but that might yeah, be. Yeah, but they, they, would they volunteer is the question? Probably not. <laughs> These drugs are not specifically mentioned in their scriptures. I'm, I'm in the middle of this book, Acid, Acid uh, tr Test by uh, Rob Schroeder. Was that it? Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, they, they actually got some early MDMA volunteers who had done no drugs or alcohol other than MDMA. And they were a really cool, interesting subset of people to study. Oh. So they're out there, kind of. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that is really interesting. Um, mm. Is that really true? I, I tend to doubt that it's true. Um, because what happened in um, Groff and others in, in, in Prague doing psychedelic research these these people middle class people in prague knew nothing about psychedelics they just had damage and they went in I, actually groff would be a great person to ask about that if we ever get him on the phone we'll ask <laughs> well you know something that um has just occurred to me as you're um as you're talking about all of this i realize that one of the major differences in the hopkins psilocybin studies compared to the other drug research that was going on is that the Hopkins studies were not compensated. Hmm. So it was partly an IRB issue. I don't know if it was the only way the IRB would have accepted it. I don't think so because they tend to, you know, you go with something once and that's what works. And so it kind of becomes part of future studies. So the very first study was not compensated because they didn't want people coming in uh, without pure motives, you know, they just wanted people who were only interested in spirituality and psilocybin. Um, so what they got is a bunch of mostly well-to-do white people, people of privilege, um, very spiritually oriented, mostly new age mm. saying, sure, I'll do this for science. Um, I'll drive myself to and from for all these sessions. I'll take time off work. You know, it's like, it's a pretty privileged position to be in. Um, so the question is like, what if you just compensated people for their time? Would you get a different demographic? Huh. Um, I know that some of the studies don't have the funding to pay for people to, uh, fly to the research center. So you have someone who's dying of cancer. Who's the person who's going to pay for them to fly halfway across the country to have this experimental treatment? I mean, um, I, I don't know if you guys heard of this woman. Um, I'm I'm blanking on her name right now, but she had a um, she had cancer and she had like eight children and her youngest child was like seven. So she went through treatment. She had a double mastectomy and then she actually walked from I think her hometown was in Louisiana, and she walked all the way to D.C. topless on like major roads with her seven year old daughter. She just did this this summer. Oh my god! As like a protest, so basically like. Here I am. I'm a black woman. Look at what this surgery did to me. Look at what cancer. This is the real face of cancer. This is not the kind of romanticized version. Um, this is what it looks like. It looks like a mom um, who has a little girl and I'm walking just to kind of bring attention to this. And so I'm also curious about that. Like, is it is it really just a money issue? Is it just if we made the studies more accessible financially? would we fix some of the demographic problem? Mm -hmm. So regarding flying, like I I'm sure being in Baltimore, you have access to plenty of African-American folks in low income sector, but in terms of like flying people to Baltimore, do you you're on the inside. So I is there enough money for this? Uh, for the cancer study, there was because funders would step up and say, I'm willing to, um, I'm willing to cover this person's flight or, you know, they would apply and say, I don't have the funds and, you know, someone would be found, but, cool. um, uh, for just the normal studies, no, not really. You know, if you're studying, mm. uh, just healthy volunteers, it was mostly local. I mean, that makes sense. You, you attract from the local population first, but, um, the reason people were flying in for the cancer study is, is actually really hard to get people to volunteer who have mm. cancer. 
This has been true since the early studies with psychedelics and cancer patients. Right. Um, even if you go into, you know, ICUs in places where there's nothing, people are not doing anything else with their time. Um, my impression, and this is from talking to some people, but also directly witnessing what my sister went through. It's really hard when you're trying to fight for your life to think about having a nice experience. It's like, I think that in order to have a psychedelic experience at the end of your life, you have to admit that you're, that you're a goner. Right. Like that's part of the psychology is like, I wouldn't be doing this unless I knew I was about to die. And so it's demanding this insane psychological proposal to people. That's basically like, we can help you. We think it's not proven, but it should, you know, have these effects. We can't cure your cancer. Um, and actually the best outcome would be that you feel okay to die. And I think for a lot of people with cancer, they're, they're still not okay about dying. Right. So it's just like, you have to get okay about dying to then have an experience that's going to make you okay with dying. It's like, you, you got to get over that hurdle. So I think that's been a challenge for the research and it'll continue to be a challenge, even if psilocybin is made available. Mm -hmm. um, how do you have that conversation with individuals and their families? Um, at what point in the treatment? Is it early on in the treatment when nobody wants to think that they're they're they're, they're the one who's going to die? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when they're the most healthy and probably the most open to something like this? Is it later on when their bodies are so frail and you know they've been ravaged by all these crappy treatments? No. So it's just like when do you offer this experience to terminally ill people? Which again just goes back to my original point: you offer it when people are young and healthy. Right. It's just such a no-brainer for me. And this is, again, where I think I differ enough from the scientific establishment that it's not my role to be a scientist. It's more my role to be um, an advocate, I think, and mm -hmm. an ally for people um, who may not have a diagnosis or may not be about to die, but better to like get clear about what that's like early on. Um, my sister was only 29. You know, It's like, when was she supposed to figure out how to have her like perfect death preparation experience mm -hmm. when she was first having her family, getting her first job, like going to college, like when was it supposed to happen? Right. So do you think that's like, I don't know, you think in the future that's possible, but do you think like there would ever be research funds to fund like that type of research like early on like I don't, I don't know it's, I don't know this is like I feel like this is a bit of, I'm like now I'm being challenged there's a part of my ego that's just like I'm gonna go back into research and do this study <laughs> just to show that it can be done yeah <laughs> I wonder um, if um with the laws being a little different in like Portugal and a few other places if it would just lower the cost barrier to do that kind of stuff a ton like you're in Lisbon you have tons of folks there's plenty of buildings. Um, it's not, a, I don't think it's a very expensive place compared to the rest of the continent over there. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it, there's so much stuff that you could do these days <laughs> in terms of research. It's, I, was, I was struck right there, Kyle, you said the funding. Could you get the funding? To mm -hmm. me, it was like, oh, we're at the point where we can talk about can you get the funding, not is this even legal? Like the the cancer stuff, like the that that was just a way to get it the ball rolling a little bit historically um mm -hmm. i don't and it's kind of hung out because it got like you were saying earlier it's kind of like a momentum with research like okay this is safe and it's okay to do this let's keep doing this um you know the worst that happens is uh someone has a bad time or whatever but i yeah well let's actually talk about the future where do you where do you maybe see the future going with, with psychedelic research or where would you like to see it go? Um, because I'm sure all of us have slightly divergent, um, opinions from the mainstream. Um, I would love for, uh, the scientists and the funding agencies, um, to kind of crowdsource the most important questions and say, how should we be spending this money? Where does the community see the most need? What are the most pressing questions? This applies to most of science and kind of medical science, but 
it does also apply to psychedelic science. Um, rather than the agendas being kind of concocted by the scientists themselves, their own kind of pet, you know, theories or, you know, favorite, um, you know, model systems of disease or whatever, uh, it shouldn't come from the funder's own, I mean, as much as I think we are all compelled by our own experience and some of the funders I think have been compelled by their own experience with either cancer or trauma. Um, it shouldn't only come from the minds of the wealthy people who are allowing the research to happen. Um, so I would hope that the future can take into account more of the kind of community's ideas about where do we want this going? What's the kind of the grand vision? Um, I would love to see the science incorporate the perspective and experience from more indigenous cultures. Um, I know at least a handful of individuals who would be great bridges there. Mm. My friend talks about this term bridge, right? Mm. Um, a person who actually helps kind of create these connections between one, one world and another, one culture and another. So there are actually white people in positions of privilege who have trained for decades with indigenous elders who could be a kind of a comfortable bridge between the science, the scientist world and the indigenous world. Those people already exist. I know that they've actually approached the scientists and some of the funders and can, been kind of dismissed. Like things are going well. We don't really want to introduce this new variable of, of the whole shamanic approach. It's too unpredictable. It's, it's weird, you know, f uh, the government agencies won't know what to think of a protocol that includes drumming and rattling and, <laughs> and spontaneous singing, you know, it's just like, un, you know, forget about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like the scientists to be more open to that in the future. And it wouldn't take much. It would, um, you know, you write up a small proof of concept study with some drumming, rattling or spontaneous singing by a trained facilitator and just see if it see if it works. Mm -hmm. See if it's just as good as the standard soundtrack with classical music. It's not that hard. Um, and if it if it works and the IRBs go for it, then great. You've just established that at least this one shamanic model is acceptable. Mm. The rest of the research can continue as before, and now you just have one more piece of information. Um, Do you have any names you could share? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. People can find them on their own if they want to make those studies happen. Yeah. They're out there. I know a few. Um, I would say related to the shamanic approach, it would be wonderful to see future scientific studies include actual plant medicine. Mm. So actual mushrooms. I know that Jordi Reba has been using freeze-dried ayahuasca capsules and the group down in Brazil also uses kind of freeze-dried ayahuasca. It's possible... I think to use a kind of similar approach with mushrooms, the dosing is a little challenging, but it's no harder to figure out, I think, that dosing than a lot of other scientific questions. So if it's important enough to know what the mushroom does, we can figure that out and come up with a useful placebo, maybe another type of mushroom that isn't psychoactive, but makes people feel kind of stomach pain and some of the other general symptoms. Mm. Um, so it'll take some creativity and some kind of logistical, you know, gymnastics, but I think it's possible. And um, maybe what's stopping that future line of research is that mushrooms are so easy to grow that if the research actually showed that they were just as good as the synthetic, I mean, there's no, there's going to be no funding in that. <laughs> right. Uh, so it's, it's easier to show that the synthetic chemical is, a, is the effective thing because doctors can get behind that even though there's no, um, I always forget the term, but it's not a new drug. You know, it's not like you have a 10 year limit uh, before a generic is made available. It's, it's a much shorter period of time if psilocybin were to become prescribable. Mm -hmm. Um, but the people who've invested a lot in this research want to see some return on that. Yeah. And the best way to see the return is to have some kind of control over the encapsulation, the dosage, the, uh, the clinic, the style of therapy, the type of training the therapists get. These are all ways of, of making sure it's only available to certain groups. Mm -hmm. Um, which finally brings me back to the privilege question is, um, if we get legal psilocybin, 
and it costs more than anybody can afford, or it's only available if you have a certain type of insurance, or if you have access to a very, you know, fancy hospice, well, that's great, but have we really made anything much better except for the, now the, now the most privileged people are going to get to die a little bit easier. Right. And I, that sounds very cynical, but I, I saw it with my sister that, um, her experience dying in the, one of the best cancer institutes in the world was a really luxurious version of hell. Mm. And it's like, it was still luxurious. Like we can't avoid framing it that way. The fact that she was able to die the way she was with so much technology and attention and care and safety um, is very different than how most people with terminal illness will get to, will get to die. Right. So should she actually have more access to better experiences first, just because she was in a position of privilege? I don't know. It's, it's really tough questions. Like I, I was thinking about this the other day. I, and you'll see these posts online, like never mix capitalism and medicine or capitalism and healthcare. Like, and you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get right behind that. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, what about those huge mega pharma corporations that actually did make some pretty awesome drugs that saved a ton of folks in the name of money? And, <laughs> you know, the future, the future um, pandemics, they could cut short by having really uh, enormous capitalist driven machines that could generate vaccines quickly or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's a really crazy double-edged sword and how, how could we publicly fund that instead of a corporation doing it? It's really, really tricky questions, but I get, I get it and I can feel it and it sucks. It's like, Oh shit, all these people are going to suffer so much more because of their station in life. But how, how could we approach that? And that's, yeah. that's the problem we have to think about. Like, how, how could we approach it? How can we democratize it, make the cost come way down? All these kind of things are problems to be solved so that, you know, um, any state hospital or local hospital could provide the same thing. I mean, but take it one step further. So, um, I mean, think about the home birth movement. Mm -hmm. I would yes. love that. I like that thought. A lot of people used to die and children used to die during birth because people didn't have access to hospitals. But there was also this kind of propaganda that went on that made people fear midwives as witches and fear doulas and fear being at home. And so now it's like it's coming back around. We realize that hospitals are sometimes actually just as dangerous, especially with interventions like C-sections. So what if dying is inherently safe also? And if you have something like mushrooms that anyone can grow and it's something that you can choose because it's your right, uh, whether you want to say it's a religious freedom or some other kind of protection, you can choose to have a certain drug experience on your deathbed and you can choose who can administer it, like a priest or someone who's trained. That kind of model makes me feel a whole lot more comfortable about the future of psychedelics than a model where you have to be in a hospital with a doctor and like all the machines. Um, I worry that people will, it's like, we're going to back to, you know, our very first topic about death being safe and simple. It's like, I would, I would hate to see the, the medicalization of something like psychedelics turn death into something that is way more of a whole process and complicated than it needs to be. Mm. It's like how, from my perspective, how can we make it as simple and easy and family oriented as possible? I'm not sure that synthetic psilocybin from a doctor will do that. I'm pretty sure that something like mushrooms that someone can grow on their own and a family member or, you know, a trusted religious professional can administer. That sounds like something more people might be comfortable with. Right. So that's kind of like part of my ideal version of the future is something where people are not afraid to die away from hospitals mm. once they once they're at that point of you know of giving up on allopathic medicine yeah i think that just kind of comes back around to like our views on death you know i think a lot of it revolves around that if we all fear it and we hold on tight i mean we're gonna 
kind of create these obstacles and these things to cling on to. Um, I think if we kind of shift our view and can start thinking about it, we kind of start stripping away all that and maybe move to or, towards a um, structure like that because we realize that it's not so scary. Um, but I don't, I, yeah, I don't know. It's always interesting because after having my experience, it's just like, well, you know, it, it, it was peaceful and, um, you know, I'm still, I'm still afraid to die. You know, it's not like I had that experience. I'm magically cured of, uh, I'm in a fear. Like, you know, it's still in the back of my mind cause I think we're hardwired like that, but it was also like an, an experience that taught me that, you know, it, it's, it's a transition period and that that's the lesson that I got out of it. And I mean, if more people could kind of maybe experience that, I mean, you view life just totally, totally different. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, for me, everything that I went through watching my sister, all of the work at Hopkins, um, thankfully I haven't had the opportunity where I had to face my own mortality in a very, you know, concrete way, but I did have to face the potential, you know, trans, you know, potential life and death of giving birth. And I chose yeah. to have my baby at home. And I remember someone kind of challenged me. They're like, what if something goes wrong? Like blah, blah, blah. And I said, if something goes wrong, I definitely want to be at home. Mm. <laughs> it was like, it was, and I had to re realize for myself that, I, not that I was welcoming death, but that I definitely didn't want to be in a place like a hospital where if I was on the edge of life and death, it's more toward the side of death that I wouldn't want to die in a hospital. I would want to die at home and yeah. even be tragic. No one's like arguing that that wouldn't be a terrible tragedy, mm -hmm. but I think we take terrible tragedies and then try to kind of insulate people from them by saying, well, if it happens in a hospital, we did the best we could. It wasn't your fault. Like, mm -hmm. Well, fault doesn't really matter once you're dead. Like, <laughs> right. <you're> dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how can we make that more comfortable for people? And not this whole blame and guilt and like, oh, you gave up. You didn't, you know, you didn't try hard enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just hope that psychedelics don't play into the current model that we have around life and death where um, – I think there is that there is that concern for me that psychedelics could just become another little plug in this machine of kind of of how we are taking human life and turning it into this thing that's that's not your own. Right. It's part of institutions. It's part of technology. And um, let's not just like have psychedelics be another part of that. Right. So let's hear hope a lot of scientists hear this and, and and get that concern because it is it's quite valid it was a brave new world psychedelics were quite the part of making people part of that machine um mm -hmm. kind of by design and it's a huge <laughs> huge concern we don't taking power back i think is like the overarching thing you're trying to get at like don't don't give away your power you can yeah, absolutely. Things at home. They're not hard. Yeah, there's actually, I can't, this is not my idea. I'm not promoting this, but there was a woman at a panel last week who said, there's plenty of vacant lots in New York City. Just start growing the medicine there. <laughs> it's like you don't own the land. You know, it's like if someone finds it, okay, you might lose some of your time and effort. But she's like, what if all of a sudden there's like all this plant medicine growing all over the city that That's people true. can use? I was like, that's so radical and so simple. Like if that's how people are framing it, like how do you use something that you know is beneficial mm -hmm. you will have to grow it? So where are you going to grow it? It's like right over there where there's nothing growing. Like <laughs> it grows. It was just, it was kind of funny, but it's a nice feedback loop for harm reduction for teenagers too. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll need to do that. Um, but well, we're, we're at a little over an hour. Do you want to throw in anything? Um, before we wrap up, I've, I've had a great time so far. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Uh, Ingmar got to talk about all the, the nuts and bolts of our program and I got to kind of speculate. Let's throw that in there that you're, you're working closely with Ingmar on this. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll say, so. I'll say a little bit right now. Um, so part of obviously my vision for the future is quite ambitious <laughs> and maybe a little bit far from where we are now. And I think one of my challenges 
on departing from Hopkins was how do I take this skill set that I've developed? It's incredibly narrow. It's illegal. <laughs> it, you know, it's like I can't use it. So it's like, what do I do with it? And I'm very happy now to have partnered with um, some amazing people in New York City, Andrew Tatarski at the Center for Optimal Living and Ingmar Gorman from, he's a maps researcher and a, he'll soon be a clinical psychologist. Uh, he's finishing up his his licensure this year working at Bellevue Hospital. Um, and we have this great team of people, of therapists and researchers and um, kind of policy advocates and also some indigenous healers on our advisory board. And we are offering psychedelic education for people who are looking to learn more about the research and, uh, and use of psychedelics and kind of harm and um, potential benefit as well as integration circles. So group circles that meet every month. And um, sometimes we have a special topic where we educate people for about 15 minutes on a certain topic and then open up for discussion or some of the groups are just integration. So if you've had a psychedelic experience, um, you can come and just talk about it. And there's this amazing giving people the power of their own voice back, their own story back, and letting people see that they can talk about these things that are taboo and illegal and allegedly dangerous, but talking about it is safe and legal and doesn't require anything other than getting over a little bit of your own shyness. And so um, it's really exciting for me because I can use a lot of the skills that I was trained in at Hopkins um, I'm not a therapist. Uh, I'm not a medical doctor, but I do know how to work with people around psychedelics. And it's been incredibly rewarding work. We're just in our first year. And I think the future is pretty wide open because we can offer people everything except the drug experience. <laughs> and that's quite a lot. Awesome. And when's your next event? Uh, we have... One event coming up uh, next week, August 17th, on a Wednesday at the Alchemist Kitchen. Uh, we, uh, we rent space there. They have an event space um, below their kind of uh, herbal lounge, which is on the top floor. And there's lots of events going on. So we have a monthly integration group there. And we're also starting a new, we call it the Psychedelic Education Series at the New School. And the first one is on September 8th. Cool. And so that series is around a certain set of topics. Um, and actually, from our conversation tonight, I'm thinking about kind of looking at this spectrum of aging. And mm. we'll have one expert come in and talk about psychedelics and aging. I think I might also try to do one on, on psychedelics and youth or kind of rites of passage. Um and maybe throw in something a little bit political toward the end of that series. Cool. Um, but just some topics that will spark conversation and, and most importantly, get people to come in and talk about their own experience. Mm -hmm. And we always emphasize that you are the expert of your own experience. And by talking about what you've gone through teaches other people to see beyond their own experience. And, um, and that I think is a psychedelic value, a kind of value that is taught by these medicines is to see beyond your own limited perspective. Mm -hmm. And for anybody interested in attending these events, where can they find information online? Uh, yeah, our website is psychedelicprogram.com, and that will redirect to the Center for Optimal Living website, and you can see who we are, our advisory board, um, the groups that are coming up. We have a training event that Ingmar, I think, spoke about in the last podcast that you guys did. Um, we've got... And then we'll hopefully be doing a lot more training for mental health professionals. Uh, again, the, the the guiding kind of principle is making psychedelics more normal and less weird for people from all walks of life. So it's not just the people who've always kind of been in the community of psychedelic users, but people who are reading about it, are curious, people who are doctors who are starting to see more people presenting with issues around having had a psychedelic experience. Um, we're trying to kind of uh, envision the issues that will be coming up as psychedelics become more common and potentially prescribable medicines and kind of preparing people ahead of time in one of the, you know, most, I think, influential cities in the world so that that will just kind of spread around. Mm. Awesome. And do you, so you have a great. personal website? I have no personal website. Nice. It's much safer that way. <laughs> 
<laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah. You can you can check out my farm website, which is happyacres.farm. Mm. Awesome. I didn't know that was a suffix. That's cool. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you have a you have a TED talk on YouTube and. Yes. I always tell people you can look up my first and last name plus psilocybin and you will see all sorts of stuff. So the internet has already created most of the resources that people might need. I don't need to put them anywhere specific. <laughs> cool. cool. Well, thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. And yeah, um, thank you. I think we have plenty left to talk about. So maybe again in the future. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about the future and I'm working every day on being less and less cynical and more and more hopeful. So thank you for <laughs> helping that vision. It's good awesome. to hear. I'll try to do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. <laughs>